you all this morning. Home not long ago, and I was walking out 
with the uh, hallway to, to visit the person that I was going to see. And there was an old man and an old woman sitting there, both of them in wheelchairs, and there was a husband and wife. And that old man, a wrinkled old man, and a wrinkled old woman, he was sitting there holding his bride's hand. And when you could see their face and talking together, that they were still madly in love with each other. You don't fall out of true love. If you can fall out of it, you never really have. I believe that uh, love that a couple hands together um, uh, uh, in a miracle way is the love that God gives. And, and true love that God gives, you don't fall out of that love. You can do things to mess it up, but you get it to fall out of that love. It's true love. Now, so we find this love is love that God gives us. What happened, one of the things that happens when you're born again, you immediately love God. You know that? A uh, person that is born again immediately loves God. When John the Baptist was in his mother's womb, he had been born in the spirit, and when his, his Lord and his master entered in the room, in his mother's room, and when he heard his mother's voice, that, that, that child left in his mother's room because the object of his love just came in that room. Uh, when Jesus Christ as a child was brought to Simeon in the temple, uh, uh, Simeon came out and he said, Lord, I, I, I'm ready to die now. I have seen my salvation. He looked at that child's face and behold, he could see that the love that was there. That child loved him as his Savior and he loved that child. Well, I, there's a sense which I love every child. After driving all day yesterday, I couldn't wait to get to see that little boy in the hospital. And so when I picked up Sarah and got down there, I wanted to hold it so bad. Some mamas don't want you to hold her as any babies. But I got to hold that little fellow and I got a picture of fruit. Uh, but love is a special thing. It is spiritual love. It is something that God gives uh, to each of his children. Now, some other things I want to point out about love before we get to the heart of our subject this morning. Mark chapter 12, verse number 29. This is the Lord speaking. Mark chapter, by the way, I say that, uh, uh, and I want to show this distinction here. Every word in the Bible is spoken by God. You, you all really don't say amen to this word. But there are certain parts of that which the Lord literally spoke himself. This is one. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 29. And Jesus answered him, a man that was questioning uh, him. He says, the first command of all these, because he's asking you which is the first uh, commandment. And so Jesus tells him about the commandments. He says, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love, this is a felt love, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So what he's telling them, you have this felt love, then you apply that love with everything that you have. What a requirement. That's a commandment. He said, that's the first commandment. And the second commandment, this is commandment one and commandment two. The first commandment is that we show our love to our God with every fiber that we have, every ounce of strength that we have. And then he says, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater, commandment greater than these. Right. So commandment one is to show our love to our God by our leadership. In John chapter 14, the verse number 15, Jesus said, If you love me, do what? Keep my commandment. That's the way we show our love to our God is by, is by keeping his commandments, obeying his commandments. Then the second commandment is likened to the first. And it's the second in his order. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And this is uh, none other commandment, uh, there's none other commandment greater than these. So the two greatest commandments is love God and love your neighbor. Now, I've got to come one other point here because of a series of subjects that I've been on for the past uh, several weeks. I want to read again, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 10. As every man has received the gift, did you know that the love that you have is a gift? As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same. Uh, to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The love that you have, my friends, is a gift of God, and we're to be good stewards of that gift and show it one to another. Now, this word that we're focused upon, the, the agape, the love that we show uh, by our actions, is translated 86 times love. 27 times is translated charity, and one time agape. It is used in such a way in the Bible so that 
Those who have what God gives them love demonstrate that love by their actions. Now, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 12, the Lord says, And because, Matthew 2, 24 and 12, and the, the cause of iniquity, iniquity shall abound, the love of many, that is, the shown, the demonstrated love of God, shall wax cold. What's that mean? Because of the things that we get involved in that turn us away from God, love shall wax cold, the Lord said. When a society in general loses its love for God, that means they fail to demonstrate their love to God, which, so, which is the first commandment, is to demonstrate your love to God by obedience to Him, and the second one is to love your neighbor. When a society loses that, that's how society is done. When a government loses that, the government is done. When a church loses that, the church is done. I've watched in my lifetime old Baptist churches that lost their love for each other. When that love goes down, when they uh, fail to demonstrate their God given love for each other, when they fail to do that, you might as well destroy and get the nails and bolt the door shut. I don't care if it is at the front of the Baptist church or any church. But whenever they fail to show love for each other, that church is done. Now, there are some that simply don't have it. The Lord speaking, or in John, in John Gibson said, John 5 and 42, he says, But I know you. The Lord says, I know you that ye have not the love or the demonstration of love. Uh, of God in you. It's not in you. There's some people just don't have it in them. You know why it's not in them? Because he didn't put it there. Okay? Now, on the night before the Lord was crucified, we to John chapter 13, on the night before he was crucified, you know, the Lord uh, sent the brethren into town, uh, and there was still a man bearing a pitcher of water. Uh, and we know what that water was for because he's going to wash their feet with that water. He says, you follow that man, and you go to the upper room, and there you make ready for the Passover. And so when the Lord came into town with the rest of the apostles, he went to that upper room, and they ate the last dotted Passover right then. And then when that meal was over, then he took the bread from the Passover table, and he blessed it and break it and told them, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he took the wine that was on that table and blessed it, and said, this is my blood which is shed for you. When that was done, then he took a towel in John chapter 13 and girded himself and began to wash his disciples' feet. He washed all his disciples' feet, and when he was done, then he told them, he says, I give you an example that you should do likewise. You know why he did that? You know why he washed their feet? Because in Luke chapter 22, after the communion, after the communion, there was a strife among them as to which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom. And so then the Lord went on to tell him, he says, you know, that's the way it is among the Gentiles in the civil governments. And he says, but don't let it be that way to you. And as he's explaining why we should wash one another's feet in a ceremonial way, uh, then he comes to John chapter 13, verse number 35. And he works his way down there. Then the Lord says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one for another. One to another. This is that demonstrated love. This is the agape love, the love that you show. So how do people know that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ? If they see you loving one another. So you being kind and gracious and long-suffering one to another. That's how they know. Nobody should have to ask you, are you a Christian? They should be able to see it in your demeanor and the way you respond to other people and the way you behave and the way you control yourself, the way you, you, you steal your tongue, and you remain loving and faithful no matter what uh, comes before you. Now, I want to give you this example before we get to John chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is in John 15. This, again, is on that same night. John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 is what the Lord did and said to his apostles before they went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. That went into the Garden of Gethsemane, he began to be very sorrowful, and then the soldiers came and got him, they mistreated him all night long, and the next day, what did they do the next day? They crucified him, he gave his life to save you from your sins. Well, as he's still talking to these friends just mere hours before he would give his life for them, in John chapter 15, verse number 9, he says, As the Father hath 
loved me, that is, as my heavenly Father, the, uh, the Lord God Almighty, as he has felt love for me, so shall I uh, love, uh, so have I loved you. He said, my Father loved me, and I love you, uh, as my Father has loved me. Then he says, continue ye in my love. He says, then you continue in my love, that is, demonstrating my love in you. If you have the love of God in you, we are commanded of God to demonstrate and to show that love throughout this life. Others are to see the love of God in us by our action. How would, you know, my wife said my friend, if I never did anything uh, to show her that I love her, if I never told her that I love her, how would she know that I love her? Uh, I was counseled with a couple one time, and the fellow said, well, I just, I, just, I just felt like she ought to know that I loved her. I said, well, how is she going to know if you don't show it? I said, do you ever bring her coffee? Do you ever do anything special for her? Do you ever, uh, do you, uh, do you, do you ever just sit down and talk to her and tell her how much you love her? Do you do that? He says, no, I just, I just thought, I just thought she was, she just knew. She ought to know that I, I love her. I said, my friend, you need to get home and you need to tell her how much you love her and you show her how much you love her or one of these days she's going to decide you don't love her and you might find out that you have to sleep by yourself for the rest of your life. Of course, a godly woman would probably just endure it. He says, continue you in my love. That means you keep demonstrating my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. That means if you keep my commandments, I'm going to keep showing you that I love you. Does your Lord keep showing you that he loves you? That's what this means. This is God pay love. He says, you stay in my commandments, and I'm going to keep on every day showing you that I love you. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Uh, God, my Father, has shown me that He loves me. He says, so I'm going to show you that I love you. And then in verse number 13, He says this, Greater love, this is demonstrated love, hath no man uh, uh, than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The greatest love, uh, the greatest demonstration of love forever is that one man would lay down his love, uh, lay down his life for another. Now, now, folks in law enforcement, in, mili- in the military in particular, they go into harm's way knowing that they may not walk out of it. You know why they do that? It's because they love their country, they love their countrymen, they love their family. They put their life in harm's way out of love. That's a great love, wouldn't you say? Jesus Christ used that, that, that very uh, principle on himself. He says, I am that man who put myself in harm's way and give my life for you. That's what he said to them. I give my life for you. That's a great love. Paul said in Ephesians 2 and 4, uh, refers to his great love wherewith he hath loved us. He loved us so much that he gave his life. So can you say that Jesus Christ demonstrated his love for us? Well, I believe we can. Now, I want you to look with me. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's broken down in three sections. One, it shows the relative value of charity. By the way, that word charity is translated 80 some odd times as love. This name means love that is demonstrated, love that is actioned. Uh, the first section is love, uh, uh, the relative value of charity. And number two is the characteristics of charity. And number three is the enduring qualities of charity. First, the relative value. Let's look at this. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not what? Charity. What does charity mean? Charity mean Now, this, the, the, this word charity doesn't mean charity the way we normally use it in today's English language. A charity in today's language means that you open your wallet and give somebody something that, uh, uh, money or something that they, uh, because they're in a needy state. What this literally means is love that is demonstrated, shown. How do I show you my love? So he says, you know, I might be the best speaker in all the world. But if I don't have charity, if I don't show love outward, I am a zero. That's what he says here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. That means, you know, uh, 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 when the brass tinkles like this sound, it's immediately gone. And what value is it? 
And he goes on. Verse number two. And though I have the gift of prophecy, though I know a lot about what's going to happen and understand mysteries and I have all knowledge and though I have all faith uh, so that I could command, I could, command uh, I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am what, does he say? Nothing. Uh, are you getting the point that uh, charity is pretty important? That we show love to our neighbor, our, our, our church family, to our friends, and our natural family? And then verse number three, he says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And so the point is, I don't, uh, you might think you're somebody, but if you're not showing charity, then you are a nobody. Now, this is the Word of God. Remember what we talked about before? <clears throat> that the whole Bible is the Word of God. It's just as if He spoke every word. He was, actually, He did. Through the Spirit, He spoke it to the writers. Now, let's look at the characteristics. What is this, what is this charity love all about? Charity suffereth long. Suffereth a long time. So, what does it mean to suffer? Well, <clears throat> you know... You know uh, Zane is over there suffering because his knee is hurting. That's suffering, isn't it? But he came to church anyway, right? Suffering means if somebody offends me, I am just going to suffer through it and love them anyway. How about that? Okay, I want to hear an amen. amen. All right? That means I just go, I'm going I'm, I'm to bite my tongue, I'm going to bite my lip, and I'm going to love them anyway. This is the Word of God. This is not something I dreamed up. This is the Word of God to the church of Jesus Christ. Charity suffers long, and it's kind, even in the face of the suffering. Charity, or this love that is demonstrated, this agape love, he says, it envieth not and if somebody uh, succeeds and does well, and someone is having successes in life, I rejoice with them, and I don't envy their success. Charity vaunteth not itself. I mean, charity doesn't boast. I want you to see what I've done. I want you to see what I've accomplished. You know, many years ago, I, when I left the, uh, the swamps of Taylor County, I didn't know how. I didn't know it, one thing about how to uh, talk to anybody. Uh, I didn't know. I, I had no social skills at all. None. And I had this old fellow tell me one time, he says, now if you want to start a conversation with somebody, you ask them about themselves and what they're accomplishing and what, what their business is. You get them talking about themselves and then all you have to do is sit back and listen. That's pretty much the case. But in this case, he says, charity does not boast about itself. He says, it, it is not puffed up. That means we don't, we don't uh, consider ourselves grand and glorious. Then verse number five, charity does not besay, behave itself unseemly. It doesn't tell unseemly jokes. It doesn't uh, make slight remarks against anybody. It doesn't talk behind anybody's back. Uh, charity uh, does, does not behave itself unseemly. See, uh, then he says, charity seeketh not her own. That means if you have um, the, the God-given love and you're demonstrating that love, then others' needs are more important than your needs. How about that? Then he says, charity is not easily provoked. You know, it doesn't have a short fuse. When I was a young man, I had a short fuse. And my, how I got past that period, I have no idea. Yes, I do. The Lord was gracious and delivered me through it, or I wouldn't have made it because my anger, and there were several times that they should have thrown me out of the military because my, I let my anger get away from me, but somebody was charitable to me, and therefore I was not thrown out. You know, I, 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 I got many a whipping because my, I had a short fuse. But charity is not easily provoked. That means we get control of our tongue and our actions and we love in spite of other people's behavior. Thinketh no evil. Boy, that's a tough one. That carries it, that carries it to an altogether different level. Has anybody ever said anything to, uh, 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 to offend you or done something against you? And then you spend the next week just chewing and grinding about it. Uh, just imagine your mind. You know, I, I need to say this. I, I need to do this. You know, I, they just can't get away. That's just not right for them to say and do that. Have you ever done that? Well, I confess I have too. What, did it, what good did it do you? None. But charity gets a handle on that and doesn't do it. It thinketh no evil. And then in verse number 6 he says, uh, charity rejoices not in iniquity. He doesn't take a lot of fun in doing and saying bad things, but rejoices in the truth. That is the truth of who God is, who His church is, and the truth of worship, and the truth of a life in Jesus Christ. Charity 
beareth all things. I mean, Cherry just, well, just take it. Just take it and keep on smiling. Just like Zane, just taking the pain and keeps on smiling. We take the charity. A charity will take offenses, hard words spoken, and just bear it. Charity believeth all things concerning God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Charity even believes about, believes about charity, doesn't it? Okay? Helpeth all things, endureth all things. Now, the enduring quality of charity. Charity never faileth. How about that? True love that is demonstrated never fails. You can never show love too much. It never fails. It's, it's enduring. You know, why, you know why it's enduring? Because it's God-given. Charity never faileth. But whether, uh, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And then he goes on and says, we know in part right now, but later on we're going to know a whole lot about a lot of things. You look forward to that day? You look forward to the day that, that we're not going to have any questions because all the answers are right there before us? Uh, you look forward to that day when the Lord says, come you blessed unto my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, and you'll find out everything, all those questions that you have right now about eternal life and, and those kind of things, it'll all be open to you at one time. Now, Verse number 12, I'll just give it now for time. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly. We don't, we don't fully understand now, but then face to faith. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. Verse number 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Charity. That's the greatest of the... Because you know what the Lord said? What's the first commandment? Is that we love the Lord. What's the second commandment? That we love our neighbor. Now, I want you to go back with me. Hopefully I'll have an opportunity to get back to the Revelation. I want you to go back with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 4. The Philistines had attacked Israel. Saul was the king. King Saul, the first king of, uh, of Israel, they had attacked, and Jonathan was uh, Saul's son, and Jonathan had a little boy, five years old. His name was Mephibosheth. Let's begin reading in verse number four. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. That means they, they, they had uh, died in battle. And then his nurse took him, his nurse took Mephibosheth, took him and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that she fell and he became lame. That is, uh, uh, Mephibosheth became lame and his name was Mephibosheth. So you can say there... Because of what else we're going about, to, we're about to read that Mephibosheth was wounded in the fall. Are you with me? He was wounded in the fall. Now, let me get to part of this before we begin chapter nine. There was a man who was wounded in the fall in Genesis chapter three. What was his name? Adam. He fell into sin and the disobedience to the Lord. He was wounded with sin in the fall. What we're about to read is a picture of what grace does when love is demonstrated. And watch this. This is Second Samuel chapter 9. And David said, after he had come to the throne, and David said, Is there yet... Uh, uh, any that is of the house of Saul, because Saul and Jonathan are now dead, that I may shew kindness for Jonathan's sake. Well, there, uh, there was a servant that had been uh, Saul's servant. His name was Ziba in the middle part of verse number three. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame in his feet. I want you to watch what David does. Now remember our subject is charity, that is love that is demonstrated. Beginning in verse number five, and the king, and king David sent and fetched him uh, uh, out of the house of uh, Ma uh, Makar, the son of Amiel, and, and from Lodbar. 
Verse number 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, notice what happened. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, uh, Mephibosheth, and he said, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Now watch what happens. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely shew thee kindness. I will shew thee what? Kindness. I will do what to thee? I will shew thee kindness. That is, I'm going to agape you. I'm going to show love to you. I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate my love for you in your father Jonathan's name. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely shew thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat of the bread of my table continually. You're going to feast in my house uh, from now on. And then he then, notice what he said, and he bowed himself, this is Mephibosheth, and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest, to, uh, shouldest took up, uh, look upon him as a dead dog as I am? This man, a young man, saw himself as un, totally unworthy and unfit to eat in the king's house. I love to see a person who feels himself unfit, unworthy to be a child of God, much less to be in the house of God. Because when I see them in that kind of state, my friends, that tells me that the Spirit of God has uh, dealt with them. They recognize who they are. They may just, uh, recognize the majesty and the glory of their Lord. And, and then notice that King David told him, Now as long as you live, you're going to be able to eat in my house. You see yourself as a, as a dead dog, unworthy of the grace and mercy uh, that I I'm showing you, but I'm telling you that I see you as fit and worthy to eat in the house of God. Let me ask you a question. Were you wounded in the fall? You were wounded in the fall in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam disobeyed the commandments of God. And as a result of that, in, in Romans chapter 5, Paul said, By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Uh, as uh, people say, I said that he was as a dead dog. He was unworthy uh, to eat in his king's house. So, uh, so, as Adam sinned, my friends, he rendered us unworthy to eat in the king's house. But just like King David, who was a type of Jesus Christ, you were made worthy to eat in the king's house, to come uh, before that great banqueting uh, table and eat of the grand things of our Lord. You were able to behold him through the eye of faith and see him uh, as, uh, as Isaiah saw him, high and lifted up. Uh, you to see him, all of his glory and all of his majesty. Have you seen him like that, my friends? Have you beheld him and felt him in your heart and felt like that the Lord is your is your best friend of all, and that he would never forsake you, that in his house there's always a good meal in his house. My favorite says, says, I am not worthy to come into your house and feast at your table. David says, I've made you worthy. I've lifted you up. Jesus Christ came into this world and He reached down and took you and lifted you up out of the pit of sin. He washed you with His blood. He glorified you with His very presence. And He set you in His house. You're here this morning to rejoice in a Savior's love and to feast at His table. And Mephibosheth was able to, to eat in the king, at the king's table for the rest of his life. What a blessing. That speaks of the undying love of your Lord and Savior. You know, so I, I guarantee you, God don't fall out of love for you. If He ever loved you, He's loved you with what kind of love? Like He told Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Is that good to know? So what is it that you can do uh, to cause Him not to love you? Is there anything that you can do this morning to cause Jesus Christ to stop loving you? No, He may apply the chastening rod to you, but I guarantee you there's nothing that you could do to stop Him from loving you. Now, I want to touch something else. Um, before we leave the Old Testament. <clears throat> Remember, the Lord told Sardis to strengthen the things that remain. Would you go with me to Jeremiah chapter 4? Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Here Jeremiah, in verse number 1, speaking to Judah, he says that if thou wilt return, return, where had they been? Uh, where did they go? Well, he told us in chapter 2 where they had been. Chapter 2, verse number 4, he says, Hear ye the word of, of, of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all ye families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have, I, have your fathers found in me, that they are gone from me, and have walked after vanity, and became vain. He says, They have departed from showing love to me and to each other. So he says in chapter 4, verse number 1, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. 
You know, if I could exhort the children of God to do one thing today in our country, in all places, I would exhort to return to demonstrating love to the Lord and to each other and to His church and to His gospel. Now, that's a commandment. It's a commandment that we demonstrate our love to our God. How do we do that? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. And the second commandment is likened to that one. Is that we love our neighbor, those around us. Alright, he said, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, uh, which is the iniquity that showed away, uh, that is associated with a uh, love gone cold, then shalt thou uh, not remove. He said, I'm going to keep blessing you. Do, uh, I, I would like to ask... All in this country, if I, if I could have a great congregation of the believers in God, I would like to ask them, how much do you love your God? Do you love Him? Do you love Him enough to conform to His commandments? You know, um, Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, telling us very candidly uh, about how our lives should be structured. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, considering what God has done for us. That therefore says what God has done. Has God done anything good for you? He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is reasonable that we live our life in obedience to our God, demonstrating our love to Him, and be not conformed to this world. He's in, and Paul writes in another place to come here apart and be a separate people from the world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to demonstrate our love to our God by dedicating ourselves to Him and to His Word and to His church and to each other. Well, listen to what else he says to Jeremiah again in chapter 4. He says, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, if thou wilt put away thine abomination, thou shalt not uh, remove, and thou shalt swear, uh, the Lord liveth in truth and judgment and righteousness. And then he goes on in verse number 3. And when we get down to this, I'm in a hurry now, so follow me. He says, For thus saith the Lord uh, to the men uh, of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground to return. Those things that remain, strengthen them. You know what remains in the children of God today? You know what remains in them? The love that God put in them at spiritual birth. That remains. And so to break up the foul ground, you know, I'm afraid this is one of those passages that, that, that the modern society uh, has just completely lost it. Most folks don't even know what foul ground is. Fallow ground is ground that has lain uh, for a period of time and has not been farmed. It has not been broken up. It has not been planted. Uh, weeds will grow up in it. Uh, this, they, it's left, though the, the ground might uh, recover itself, uh, so they'll be planted again. But he says, now is the time uh, to break up your fallow ground. In this context, the love that God has put in your hearts, it's time to break up that fallow ground. It's time to seek ways that I might show love to my God, to show love to each other, to Break up your fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. Uh, the thorns is, uh, and the, you know, the things of the world is not going to profit you one bit, but the things of God will profit you with joy and peace and gladness in this life. Then he says in verse number four, circumcise yourself. <clears throat> you know, it would be good to spend a lot of time on the various uses of the word circumcise, but this is one that you do to you. Notice what he says, circumcise yourself. This doesn't mean give yourself spiritual birth. This doesn't mean make yourself a child of God. This means you do a work on the inside of you that you can do because God has given you love. Uh, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart. That is, mark yourself. How do you mark yourself this morning so that people know who you are? Get the basket off the candle and let people see your good works so they can pat you on the back and tell you what a fine little Christian you are. Nope. So they see your good works and glorify your God. Now, I want you to go back with me to the Revelation epistle. Let's work it backwards. Let's go to chapter 3. Verse number 15. The church at Laodicea. He says to the church at Laodicea, he says, I know thy works. If, if the Lord were just to stand up here in front of you this morning and say, I know your works, what would be your response? I'd begin to tremble in my shoes. 
He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that thou wert cold or hot. That I might see something out of you anyway. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This is God speaking. That doesn't mean he's going to cast you into eternal hell. But what it means is you're going to lose your church, you're going to lose your joy, you're going to lose your peace, you're going to lose your comfort in this life, you're going to lose your refuge. Would God do that? I guarantee you, he did it. Now, he's God. He can do whatever he pleases, right? All right? Then in verse number 17, he explained, Because thou sayest, I am rich. Laodicea had a world-renowned banking system there. He says, you say you're rich? You have, you, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need... And, and increase with goods and have need of nothing? I don't, I don't need anything. I don't, I don't need to spend time on my needs praying. Uh, I don't need to uh, uh, have a prayer service at church. I don't need that. We've got everything. Uh, we got a strong army. we got a good uh, law enforcement folks. Uh, we got everything we need. We don't spend, need to spend time on our needs in prayer. Boy, does that sound familiar? Oh, no, we don't need to pray. We just need a moment of silence. What good does that do? That's a waste of a good moment in my book. He said, How need of nothing, and knowest, you just don't know, and then knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. He said, You're in a pitiful state, and you just don't even know it. You've lived in comfort and ease for so long, uh, you just don't know how wretched you are. The time is now that the children of God in this country uh, understand that we are in a wretched state, and the only way we find relief is at the throne of grace. We have a great need, do we not? We need to be fed upon the grace and the mercy of the Lord our God. Now, he says in verse number 18, he says, I counsel. This is God giving you counsel. You know, a lot of people have given me a lot of counsel in this world, and I, I'd say thank you and ignore it. This is a counsel we need not ignore. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire. He says, you think? You think that you're rich and you don't need anything? He says, you buy of me gold, the nuggets of grace and love and peace and joy and obedience that you obtain when you obey me. If you be willing and obedient, what's going to happen? You shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He says that thou mayest be rich in white raiment and thou mayest be clothed in and that thy shame, uh, thy, thy nakedness, do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. You anoint your eyes with eye salve by reading and studying the Word of God and laboring in the Word of God and coming to the house of God and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ speaks. Back up now to Sardis in chapter 3, and um, beginning at verse 1. And unto the church of the angel of Sardis, I write thee, uh, these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and that the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, uh, that Thou livest and art dead. Now, I walked out early this morning, and my fig tree is coming out again. How about that? But there's a part of it that is gray and dead. That one, there's one limb that sticks up about four and a half feet that is stone dead. Not a leaf on it. It's dried and not a fig on it. But over here to one side is those new sprouts that have come up. He's got little figs all over it. The birds fly by there several times a day checking them to see if they're ripe yet. But the point is, they looked dead. You know how they look dead? Because they ain't showing love for anybody but themselves. He says, thou art dead. He says, be watchful. He says, you need to pay attention and, and strengthen the things which remain. That love of God that he's put in your heart. He says, strengthen. And how do you strengthen anything? How do you strengthen your muscles? You know, you know how you do that? How do you strengthen the, 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 the muscles in your legs? I used to do it by running uh, five, six, seven miles a day. Now I do it by riding a bicycle. I grab this old bungee cord and I pull on that thing and act like a fool out there. But it strengthens my muscles again. And so how do you strengthen what remains? How do you strengthen the love that's in your heart? You put it to use. You exercise it by showing love to your God and to each other. And back to the church at, uh, at Ephesus. We'll conclude with this one. 
Verse number 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That means, you used to show me you loved me. You used to come to the house of God. You used to, you used to uh, uh, look around and see, uh, well, how can I show love to my neighbor? How can I be kind and, and, and considerate and long-suffering? How can I do that? He says, Thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, for whence thou art fallen, and repent and do thy first work. He's like... You know, a lot of folks can remember the very moment that they were born of the Spirit. And I am so thankful for that. I, I don't remember that moment. It, it, I just don't remember. Ever since I was a little tiny fella, I have loved going to church, loved singing, and loved the prayers, and loved the preaching, I've all, and loved the people. I've always had that love in me. I just don't remember but can you imagine living through a life uh, not really caring at all? The church have no, you just don't, you're not even interested in it. The gospel is just a waste of time. Can you just imagine just living a life uh, not having no concern for the things of God? And then all of a sudden, in an instant, God turned the light on and you love the Lord, you love the gospel, you love the church, you love the refuge, you love the peace, you love the joy. Man, the life, I have seen people change in an instant and in a moment and that great love just abounding them. And Lord, the Lord says, you remember that love? You remember how you experienced that love all of a sudden one day? He says, you return to that love. Do the first work, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick. I'm going to take the joy away from you, your family, your church, your life, your society. I'm going to take the joy of the gospel away from you, except you repent, change. The word love, my friends, is a powerful word. And it embraces the, the first and the second commandment in the relative importance. One is that we demonstrate our love to our God. And number two is that we take that love and we show it to each other. May God bless you, my friend.